I just unplug my mic. I'm just using it as a prop. We are live. What's going on, y'all? What's up? What's up? What is up? Yo, yo. I got my live set up on IG. So we got my boy Nick. Um, got my boy Nick joining us today. Nick Vlay. He's on my acquisitions team. This dude's a killer, bro. He's a killer, Mike. Um, we got him on here. We're gonna yes, break down, you know, his business, see what see how his journey in real estate has been so far. You know, he's still he's still a pup. So we wanna see we wanna see how where he's going and kind of see if we can point him in the right direction. Um but yeah, let's get into it, Mike. What's, what's going on, brother? Shit, dog. Busy week. How about you? Bro, busy, busy week, bro. We stopped uh we stopped two foreclosures. Um bro, bro we stopped two foreclosures on the same on the day of like the day before that they were supposed to be auctioned up. Like it was it was so crazy that um the first one was actually one in Houston, right? This one, it was so close that the bank actually accidentally messed up and they still sold the house at the auction. So we had to get it, we had to get it rescinded. So they uh she going in and she called and she uh she straightened everything out. But bro, it was so close, but I'm grateful to yeah, hold on, hold on. So they closed on it. Yo, closed on it. Like the guy, the guy who bought it went to uh went to the house and told the seller like Yo, know, like this is my house. Like, I just bought this house. You have to get out in three days. It was so crazy. He wired the funds and everything. Yes, he bought Damn. the house. I know he was sick. He was sick. He was sick. But you know, he that guy was that guy was an asshole, bro. Like you don't. First of all, you don't just go to the house and try to kick somebody out. This is an old man, right? Like you just told him he's gonna kick him out and lock the door, lock the uh, change the locks and everything. And he can't even do that. He got to go through eviction and all that extra stuff, bro. right? So he's just trying to scare him. He was trying to he was trying to scare him, bro. And we we got it solved. We got it fixed up. Um, and then the other one was was crazy as well. We had to raise like eighty eight thousand, and uh, the day before, because the the mortgage company they weren't trying to hear nothing, bro. They weren't trying to trying to do anything. They they just wanted their money, or they were going to take the house to so, reinstate the arrears. Reinstate the arrears. We haven't even ran title yet. Okay, so talk about that a little bit. What happened? How did you raise that? So, okay. so sub two straight sub two squad up, bro. Christina Solera, she sent the lead. Mm -hmm. Um, James on my team locked it up. So we that, that was another crit. I'm sorry, I'm trying to set up my, my shout out to James. He's a killer. Yeah, James is a killer too. Um my team is just straight been crushing it, bro. But this was this was a deal where Christina sent us the lead, um, the PPC lead from I Speed to Lead. Shout out to them. Catch me on their podcast next week. Uh, Speed to Lead, uh, Speed to Lead, lead. Um, foreclosure was scheduled for Friday. She actually, her family owned the house for years, right? Her mother died. The house went to auction when her brother owned it. She ended up buying it back from the auction, right? But they didn't want to. The bank didn't want to accept her payments because she wasn't on the mortgage for some reason. Right. That's how they got back into this position. So it was crazy. So we ended up getting them out. Um, we found the money in sub two the day before they wired it. UPS wired it. Um, well, not wired it, but they sent it through UPS. Christina picked it up, picked the seller up from her house, went to the courthouse, and they they fixed it. So like how did they send it in hundreds? I don't even know, bro. I think they just wrote, wrote a check. <laughs> wrote a flat check, bro. <laughs> but that's just the power of squatted up. Like that's dope, bro. Up, we're gonna flip that house and probably have a pretty good, pretty good profit on this. So you're in and out on that one? Yeah, we're we're gonna be in and out on this one. Yeah, bro. I've been running into some um I wouldn't say competition, but other buyers and messing with my deals as well. I got to lock something up after our podcast today where we have a, um, we have a little bit of competition on it, baby. I'm ready. Yeah. For 
don't, I don't come, I don't compete, man. I dominate. So I'm gonna go yes. watch up. I love that. I'd love to see how you maneuver that. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna film the whole thing. So you guys, I already have it plotted in my mind. I'm gonna use all right. So a couple of things that happened the past couple of weeks in my business. We had gotten a contract. Um and there was a, another buyer on the deal. They ended up filing a memorandum. We didn't really know that they were buying the house. Comes to us about to close it like four days before and a memorandum pops up. Oh, so we, we weren't able to do anything. Explain, here's, explain to our viewers what a memorandum is, bro. Got it, yeah, 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 my bad. So here's the situation. I go out to a property. Um, I get the property locked up under an agreement. Now, we're, we're probably, I think the close date was like 30 days out from that day that I got there. So we start getting our contractors ready. We're going to fix and flip this property. We're getting everything ready. Our funds are ready, everything. Ran title, comes to find out that another company in our market had it under contract. And wow. what they did is they went down to the county recordings office. They said, Hey, everybody in town, we're buying this property. Nobody else can buy it. So that's what a memorandum is. A memorandum pretty much states that, hey, you can you cannot sell this house to anybody but us. So that's what that company did. But here's a caveat. They went out to the property, right? Yeah. And they locked the seller up. And at the end of the day, um, I, I, I wasn't able to talk to that company. They They wouldn't get on the phone with me. So I don't have their side of the story. All I have is the side of the stories that I know, right? So here's where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. And essentially what happened is they go out to the property, they lock them up under a purchase and sale agreement with a, like seven day contingency or something like that. And they lock them up at 240. Got it. Now they call them the next day and say, hey, we overstepped our boundaries. We got to be at 210. And my seller's like, um, yeah, bro. Nah, I'm not doing business with you. Like you're doing some shady shit. I'm good. I end up walking the property like a week later and he's like, oh yeah, hell yeah. I like you way better. I didn't really, I didn't know that there was another contract in place. Uh huh. Right. So I go forward with finally trying to close title and we find that memorandum out. Dude, I go to that property yesterday because we had some fees right? We had to pay our attorneys. We had to pay um, for the LLC setup. We had to pay for our appraisal. We pay for a couple of things. And in order to release our interest in the property, I'm like, yeah, I don't mind doing that. Obviously, I'm not going to be an asshole like this guy is. Yeah. But I will release my interest if you pay our fees that, you know, cause us to get into the deal. Talking to the other buyer? No, talking to the seller. The seller. Okay. The seller signed two PNS um purchase and sale agreement so what we ended up doing is i had to go there dude he was legitimately in tears yeah damn like in freaking tears bro like, so what what happens like i'm not too familiar with the memorandum and and how that enacts and stuff like what happens when like how does he ever get out of that with with the first buyer he doesn't he has to sign wow it. wow so here's the shady shit bro in my opinion Granted, I don't know their side of the story, so whatever. Yeah. They're probably listening to this. I'd love to have a chat with you. Please DM me. Yeah, let's um, the guy out. Yeah. Right? Like, I'd love to talk to the owner. He wouldn't get on the phone with me. I had to talk through his attorneys, whatever. I hope he's listening to this. Please give me a call. I'd love to do some deals. Um, so with that being said, they're probably going to have to close on it at 240. Right. Like they can't come back to that 210. Their purchase and sale agreement says 240. So another little background story is I guess the seller said um, that the owner of the company tried calling them back and saying, hey, yeah, actually, we can do 240. We just got to get our guys in there. But at that point, the seller didn't trust the, the company. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I don't blame them. It's like, a, it's like a bait and switch type of sales tactic. In my opinion, it's more like, dude, just do a better job in your sales process. Yeah, be upfront in the beginning, right? 
Yeah, dude, if you need to lock it up at a low price, do a better job in your sales process. Don't lock it up too high and use it as like a tactic. That tells me that your sales process stinks. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're on stuff that gives that gives wholesaling a bad name. No like, shit. That stuff that has people hate wholesalers. Dude, legit, I have the seller in the freaking living room yesterday bawling his eyes out, dog. Like legit bawling his eyes out, wishing he's like, dude, I had the money too. I was just trying to do this thing fast. I should have just fixed it up and went on market with it. Like, I'm such an idiot. I'm such an idiot. I'm such an idiot. I'm like, ah, you just didn't, you didn't know. Right. So whole process. With, I think the, the whole entire thing with this is exactly what you just said, Daryl. Be upfront with everything, dog. Like if you're wholesaling the property and that's what you intend to, no matter what, like if you have no intentions on buying the property, let the seller know that yeah. like, hey, we have a bunch of partners that we work with um, for this one. I'm not too sure if we're going to close on this deal, but at the end of the day, nothing will change for you. The price is your price. You're going to get your number. You know what I mean? And just let that, let them know that up front. And it also, it also like relieves some tension off of your shoulders. But, bro, uh, that that's big, bro. When, when it's, when they know that you're not the buyer, like if you're, if you disclose that to them and let them know that, Hey, like, I work with other other investors. I may not be the end buyer. I may, you know, assign this to one of my buddies. Mm -hmm. Yo, like you said, bro, it takes so much stress off your shoulders. It, it just makes you feel so much easier. Like, like I, I closed on I'm closing on an option contract, and I straight up told the seller, I'm not buying this. This isn't this isn't a house that I'm going to buy. I'm not going to do a flip on this. We're doing too many projects, and it just doesn't work for me. But I have a buyer for you, right? Yeah, and, legit. Dude, I'm working on one right now. Yo, yeah. when I when I tell you I had to I had to get a price reduction, right? It made it so much easier, right? Like I'm, I just yes. said, yeah. yo, like there's the buyers here. All my buyers are coming in at here. We need to come to here for me to make a profit, right? Is that is that okay? And he's like, yeah, of course. Right? Here, here's here's the line, bro. It's bro, this this thing just the numbers are way too tight for my model. Like yeah. I'm trying to make a certain amount of dollars on the money that I put into the property. And I'm just trying to work these numbers. It just doesn't make sense for our model. But I mean, I hang out with all these guys, right? Like they're my best friends that are doing deals. And I think the buyer here might be more of like a buy and hold investor or something like that. But the good news is I know them. However, I can't shop it out at that price because they're going to look to me like, dude, why are you trying to bring me a bad deal? Right. And then that kind of hurts my credibility in the marketplace. And it's just really not a responsible thing for me to do in my business. So like if we can, if, if I get you this number and I sh you let me shop it out at this number, I think I can make it work for you. I like that. I like that. Well, let's let's talk to let's talk to our guest, bro. We got Nick Vlay, man. Yes, sir. Oh, man. Sir, appreciate you guys having me today. Blessed and highly favored with all you guys in this room. I just love getting into a bunch of rooms with, with people that, you know, know what they want. Yo, so, awesome, bro. So like, tell us, tell us a bit about your journey, bro. Like how were you in real estate last year? Like what were you doing? Like, this uh, time last year, bro. Yeah. So, I mean, this time last year, uh, it's crazy to actually look back and think. So, you know, I, I was making a big move, right. I was making a move to the city. Um, I knew I always wanted a faster pace and something inside of me just always was striving towards ownership. Right. And I really started out like on the social media wave of everything, like with TikTok and streaming and doing stuff like this. Right. We actually had our own podcast, me and my boy. And, you know, we'd make videos and stuff like that. And, you know, I got put on to Pace Morby. And from there, you know, I was doing a serving job, just getting that blood money. Right. Just getting a paycheck every single week, uh, being surrounded by, you know, a bunch of alcohol and a lot of temptation. Right that I wasn't going to take part in. And I just was focused on, on real estate from there. So after my nine to five, I would, you know, continue to, to learn. And then after that, take action, right? Cause if we're just learning forever, I'm never going to get out of, out of the nine to five, the rat race. I love that. Bro, what were you doing for um, content before with you and your homie? Yeah. So good question. I was doing um, like music videos, music videos, oh, rappers, yeah. um, we were doing podcasts. I was doing my own thing on TikTok. Um, I have like way too many videos. I really just, 
I had a goal, right? So I had a goal where to figure out the algorithms for TikTok and it, they change constantly now. So they're not the same as they were a year ago. Um, but what I would do is I'd say, okay, I need three videos a day and they need to be at this time and I need to go live because when you go live after it, like they show your videos out like crazy. The, the whole algorithm was just kind of like, and it still is like, how can you keep someone on the app for as long as possible? And then they benefit you. So I was really just studying that. And I was a big gamer too, but I had to, I had to give up a lot of stuff, right. To, um, focus on, you know, what's important cash flow. That's big. But like, we were kind of talking about that last week too, like some things that you had to give up and channel into channel that, that energy into to something positive, right. Video games are something that I had to give up, right. Like that's, that's so big that you said that. So, I mean, when did you transition like from the nine to five and like just consuming content to start and taking, taking action? A hundred percent. Yeah. I was nice too. Like I killed Ninja in Fortnite. I want to let that be known. Daniel Keanu knows it. Uh, yeah. So basically what happened, person, right? In the Fortnite world. What do you say? Ninja's a big person in the Fortnite world. Yeah. He was huge. He was huge. Uh, um, Didn't he do some things with Drake? That's like the only reason why I know. Yeah, he. I think he had like three hundred thousand viewers when he did something with Drake, and Drake ended up giving him like fifty k because he won a game. Bro, yeah. just a quick story. I bought an Xbox one during um, a snowstorm in college. Played it for like an hour, and I never. It's. I think it's still in my closet. <laughs> That's good, bro. Because I because I stuck, not because I didn't want to play, because I stunk at video games. Yeah. And and the thing is, like, I always had that competitive drive. So I always wanted to push it when I'm playing a game. I'm not just playing it to have fun. I always wanted to be professional in that scenario. So I always had a vision. But going back to your question, Daryl, is to be honest, um, I was serving. Right. And then the rules were starting to cave in on you. And it started to feel more so like more more of a prison in there. Right. And just not the best energy. I I wasn't surrounded by the energy that I wanted to be surrounded by. So I ended up having the conversation with my boss. I asked her, you know, hey, can we have a talk? And she already knew from there, um, you know, what was about to go down. So that was in January. And it was crazy what I was feeling before I was about to quit, right? Like your heart, your your thoughts are telling you different things. Hold and on, like this January? Like the yeah. 2022? Oh, shit. Yeah, this January, yeah. man. And then from there, it's it's just been... It's been great. The thing is, you have to take that leap, right? And I'm speaking to everyone else is like, you guys already did this. And I just started. You guys, ha- you have to take that leap where it, it's going to be uncomfortable and there's going to be fear and there's going to be doubt where you don't know when that paycheck is coming in. Right. So talk about that leap, bro. Like, because yeah. this is fresh. This is fresh. fresh. <laughs> talk about the feeling. Like, because you had to talk to your boss, right? Talk about, damn, I feel like, am I going to let her down? Just talk about that a little bit. Yeah, right? Because I had a great relationship with her. And, you know, originally, I was I was busing, right? So I moved to the city. I found a busing job right away. And I didn't want to bus, right? I've been a server. But you have to go back and you have to pay your dues, right? So they were upset that I, I had to leave because the other person, um, she offered me the serving job right away, right? And I was grateful for that. Um, you know, just... When I work, when I work for someone, I work hard, right? I work hard and I make sure I go above and beyond. Um, so talking to her about it, it was something that, you know, I, would, I, would, I was literally in the bathroom. And there wasn't many people there, right? I was in the bathroom, just in the mirror, just like trying to practice my pitch and everything and, and going over every single situation when my mindset wasn't as strong, or, uh, as, strong as it is now. And just like thinking about, I was thinking – two months ahead, I was thinking three months ahead about what's what's about to happen, right? And I was just kind of thinking of a whole scenario in the future. Um, I was fighting, I was I was going back and forth, like, should I stay? Should I not? I was texting other like someone else about it, but it had nothing to do with them, right? It had nothing to do with them. So I could see from their point of view, but I would still I would I would go back to me, right? I would relate inside of me and I'd say, hey, this is something that I gotta do. Um, regardless of whether it'd be uncomfortable. I had the conversation with her. She knew what was about to happen and we had a great conversation, right? She was super supportive, actually, 
of my decision and you know she encouraged it so it went well cool bro so what were people saying like when you were talking to your homies you're like yo i'm thinking about making this move were they like uh dude maybe you should just try to do something on the side for a little bit yeah so as as it was happening the day of um i was talking to my homie and his girl right and they're getting married in august shout out to brian so I was, I was talking to them about it and, you know, my friend was, he was with it. He was like, listen, man, this, if this is how you feel, go for it, right? Go for it. And my other, uh, his girl was saying the same thing, right? They were saying the same thing. So there was a little bit, you know, I don't remember it, everything to a T, but there was a little bit of like pushback when I was talking to, to one of my girlfriends that I knew at the time. Um, she definitely... This is a mindset, right? If they work that job and they they get that nine to five, it's like all that fear is going to come in. Like, what are you going to do? All that stuff. And then from after that day, you know, I work at Planet Fitness. So, I mean, I don't work at Planet Fitness. What am I saying? I work out at Planet Fitness and I saw a T-Mobile and someone actually offered me a job there. I got offered a job at MTA and stuff like that. And your mind would tell you like, oh, T-Mobile could be good for sales. Like you get free phones and stuff like that. But Daryl said it to me. It's like you surround yourself around others that don't have the same ambition and drive as you. So no matter what that paycheck is and knowing that it's coming every week, it's not, it's not something that I want to do. Got it. Yo, so you, you left your job before you had anything set up. Anything. Yeah. You just left yeah. the job with a leap of faith. Yeah, that's some gangster shit, bro. No, that's fucking, that's awesome, bro. Like, that's that's when you talk about burning the ships. And have, have you ever read, read Think and Grow Rich? No, but I'm going to. So they they talk about um, I forget what what general and what army they were talking about, but they were talking about they they had a war, right? So he had his whole his whole whole army. They they got onto the they arrived on ships, right? Once they got onto the beach. He turned and he told it. He told the team, "Like, burn the fucking ships, burn them all, because we're not leaving here unless we win, right? We're not retreating. We're not running away. We're not doing nothing. We're burning these ships. We're either gonna kill everybody and win this war yeah. and capture this this country, or we're gonna die trying. Mm-hmm. Like, and and that's what that's what you did, bro. You took that leap of faith and you burned the ships. And I commend you on that, bro, because it's it's been working out." Right, and it's not most people they're they're scared. They're scared to do that, and it doesn't. I don't recommend everybody to do it. You have to be a different type of person to yes. to be able to to just leave and just say, okay, my back's against the wall. Let me do what I got to do. Right, a lot of people will fold mm-hmm. and try to find another job. Right, because this is not an easy business. And and speaking of that, January you quit your job. You started off on your own what what were you doing like how were you getting at least what was, what was your plan yeah and that's that's it's actually interesting to think back there because it is so recent but like it is hard for me to think back um in the past and stuff like that so what i was doing is shout out to eric um me and eric were he provided lead generation he had freedom soft and he was doing like text campaigns and stuff like that and then i would just use paces five thousand oh, dollars there he is i was just using paces uh five thousand dollar list and any way I could get lead generation without putting my money into it, I was down for. Like I, I did the skip tracing on PropStream. I, I went through some stuff like that, right? And I wasn't seeing the results, right? It was cold calling, right? It's I basically always describe it as I put myself through hell week, right? And just learning those those phones, being told like to f off and things like that. It's it's things you have to go through to continue to keep making these calls, in my opinion. So. That's what I started out with. And I had I had no idea. Right. So basically, my whole mindset was. I'm around people that that do have the ideas. So anytime I get on a conversation where, you know, let's just say I didn't I didn't know probate at the time. Right. I could just go to the Facebook da 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 da, da and then figure it out. Squat like I, the squad up was always in my mind every single time because just, you know, doing the stuff before prior with TikTok and like influencing like squatting up was just in my blood so that's why like i love this community and everything it stands for yeah bro that helped me out too 
especially on creative deals because mm -hmm. um, when I had some creative deals finally come in the pipeline, I knew I had the community on my back to take care of them. I love that. Me, I was just like going into it as wholesale, wholesale, wholesale. I learned this business from a cat, um, a cash buyer, a fix and flipper. Before Sweet. I got into sub two. So yeah. then once I got into sub two, that's all I thought about. And then creative finance happened and I was just like, yo, you know what? Once a creative finance deal comes up, I'm just going to let somebody in the community take it down. Yo, and that's that's big. Like, I was just telling somebody, I was just telling the Daily Dial this. Like, I was just sitting in on a Daily Dial the other day, and I told them, like, uh, even if you don't know something, you're in a community where you know somebody who knows something, right? So, which means you really know it. Like, so it's nothing to just say, I don't, that's a good question, right? My partner knows this. Let me find out. Uh, let me get him on a, on a phone call with you, and we'll figure it out, right? So, like, mm -hmm. leverage in the community is is so huge. And Bro, that was in um, Think and Grow Rich. Do you remember the example that I'm thinking about? I don't. Remind Where me. Somebody, I forget who it was, but somebody was on the stand, and he was getting rifled with questions, right? Mm -hmm. um, shit, I forget who it was. But somebody was on the stand getting rifled with questions, and one of the questions was like, this dude was a high level business guy. One of the questions was, well, hey, dude, you don't know anything. Like you you have no knowledge. And he's like, well, yeah, I don't, but I have a full army that does. So yeah. it's one conversation away from figuring out what the heck I need. So realistically, I'm as knowledgeable as anybody else in my network. Yep. And you guys, I want to mention, you guys are speaking and you believe it, right? These people, like when you're starting out, you really have to believe it. And that's why everyone starts with the mindset because you have to come off like your most confident self when you're talking to a seller, regardless of if you know it or not. You guys know someone that, that does. And when it comes to squatting up, I would say a big fear a lot of people have is trust. And they're scared to let a deal go away or something like that. But any day of the week, I would give 50% or whatever it is to squat up with someone and learn that situation and add it to my tool belt next time. 100%. 100%. And that took me some time to, I'm glad you figured that out early, right? Because it took me some time. And me and Mike were just like, it's crazy. We were just talking about this last week on the podcast. Like it took us both some time to figure out that that's, that's this business squatting up, Right. Like fifty percent of a a watermelon is way more than fifty percent of a grape. Like mm -hmm. I'll do that all day, you know. Shit. Yes. So, and I don't even know if I said that right, but that like it's real. Like I will squat up all day. Like there's things where I don't even want to. You, know, you see it in the business, bro. Like I don't even want to touch Dispo half the time. I want to talk to exactly. someone, raise money, and Dispo. I just outsource that, right? Mm -hmm. Like so, squatting up is so important and. And speaking of that, so January, you, you jumped into it on your own. You were squatting up. And then uh, and then what happened? Because you were calling Fizzbos, too, I, I remember. Um, oh, yeah, it was rough. How I found you. I'm like, dude, <laughs> you're coming to me with these damn Fizzbo leads. Like, stop. <laughs> like, stop. It was the worst. 100%. I was, I was actually – I think my plan was to try and go creative on Fizzbos. And that's like crazy, right? Because a lot of these people are super price motivated and they just want the cash. Mm -hmm. um, I guess that was my play. And actually my first time meeting Daryl, it was a deal on Fizbo where I saw that it said seller financing, open to seller financing. And immediately I started thinking like, this is the one, this is the one, this is the one, right? Uh, you know, sure enough, I, I get, I forgot who, but someone was like, yo, talk to Daryl. I immediately talked to Daryl. He gets into a room with me and we start underwriting the deal, right? And from there, it was just like trying to figure out, like he was putting me onto so much game about the seven uh, parts of the entry fee, everything like that. You're just learning so much. And, you know, it's, it's a limiting belief to have people like Daryl, people like Mike, people like Claudio. Like you, you might, they might seem larger than life where you don't want to talk to them, but damn like claudio even like stayed after during the meetup in new york city like to, to hang out and have a conversation with me and it was a blessing like it was it was so great so going back to the question what, what was i talking about i like to talk a lot guys oh uh, we, were, we were talking about um 
Damn, I just forgot too. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's still financing. So, financing the yeah, so book, we're yeah. we're underwriting that, right? And I think it's gonna be something good. Black Swan, his partner, isn't cool with it, right? So that destroys everything. And from there, I was literally gonna send him a contract just so he can get out of his partnership with his boy, and then I could work with his boy on it. But his boy actually brought the money. So it was something where like uh, his Facebook group, like they had a meeting. It was super weird, whatever the, it was a fail, right? It was my first big fail and it was, it was rough, right? Like everyone has that, right? Where they take it and they think they're right there and then everything comes crashing and falling down. But it's about in that moment, what are you going to decide to do? Am I going to go work for the MTA right now after that? Or am I going to keep making these calls, right? Regardless of if it's FISBO or not, like, what am I going to do? And I just kept going. By the way, that's going to keep happening just at a bigger scale. Yep. It's just going to be way bigger spreads. Like, you're going to lose $100,000. Legitimately, that deal that I was talking about, yeah. I would have made over $100,000 on that deal. And it just got, yes, it just got taken away from me. Like, bro. Wow. And I was, at first, I was like, Damn, dude, like, what the heck? For like an hour, I ain't going to hold you. I was a little bit salty for like an hour. And then after that, I was like, yo, I just got to go find another one. Literally, I was another right one out in the podio, like, all right, <laughs> you know, this, this is exactly what I did. I got in my podio and I started hitting up all the leads that were like just right there. And I said, yo, we just had a deal fall through. Like, I need to send these funds somewhere else. And immediately my mind just went on like, yo, I got, I just got to go make more money. I like that pitch. You let it, you let it go right through you, right? You, you, you were salty, you said for an hour, but after that, it's like, all right, this is abundant. Let's just, let's keep moving. Leo, what up? Yeah, bro. So that's, that's awesome. Um, Daryl, how did you um find Nick? I know just so, from the seller, seller financing deal. Yo, so I actually seen, I don't even think Nick knows this, but I, I was in there, you were on Elena's mindset Zoom, and I seen you telling your story and talking to Keston, and um, that's when I first first noticed Nick, and I'm like, yo, this kid, this kid's going to be special, right? And then he just hit me up, right? He just hit me up out the blue, like he was saying, and um, I'm like, yeah, let me, let me help you out. Helped him out the first time. I didn't think I was going to add him to my team, but this dude just kept on hitting me up. He was, he was like a little, little gnat, just kept on hitting me up, asking me about this damn, this damn Fizbo deal and then other Fizbo deals. And I'm like, bro, just come on, man. Like, I got you. Just, just come on. Come, come here. Let me show you. Let me show you something. <laughs> <laughs> so I brought him on and this dude has just been crushing it, bro. I didn't know. So you've been with me since like what, February? February, yeah. And how many deals do you have under contract right now? Three. Three deals under contract. One of them we already had we already uh sold for twenty five thousand dollars. That's that should be closing the next couple of weeks. So like oh. crushing it, right? But you know what he's doing? That's that's just different. Consistent. That's making eighty to hundred calls every single day. Mm -hmm. like, every day. And what, what he said earlier, right? He said he said he when he works for somebody, he goes hard. Right. And he was not lying, bro. This dude goes hard. Like he he works a hundred percent all day, like making calls. We're sending out I'm helping him send contracts out at 9 30, 11 o'clock at night. Right. And like I'm not gonna say no. Like, of course, I'm gonna I'm gonna help him out because it's it's helping everybody out, right? It's helping me out. Right. So I guess Nick, what what would you say is the importance of of jumping on somebody's team, right? Rather than doing it doing it on your own like what what were the differences you've seen from you know when you were doing this on your own um you know just doing fizzbo leads and you know free free cold calling and stuff like that to to now mm -hmm. and that's the thing like i feel like thanks to you like i am a squad up success story and it's like where it is i think the best thing is structure right is when you have to do everything yourself your mind can't focus. So when you focus, when when I'm I'm on your team now and we have these morning meetings and we say what we're grateful for every morning and we talk about how we did yesterday and what we're going to do today and how many contracts we're getting out today, it's that structure that um, catapults you into the day where it's like, okay, now I can only focus, I'm only focusing on talking to people that are actually motivated and have pain 
and move this down the pipeline. That was that was the best thing because when it's cold call, like people can think they have this, they have a lot of fears, right? Where it's like, okay, what what happens when I get to this contract point? What happens when I get here, here, and here, and here? But having you in the camp, it's just like none of that would ever even be in my brain. You know, it's just how can I be the best salesperson in the world, right? And Sandler, Sandler's book is just like helped me out so much with that. Bro, I'm actually jealous about that because if I was talking to Mike like eight, nine months ago, probably like a year ago, actually, I would have screamed, yo, do exactly what Nick is doing. Yo. <laughs> like, I would have been like, yo, what the heck are you doing? And I was just stubborn. I was just an asshole. Just stubborn. And in result of that, I ended up wasting a shit ton of money. Just on systems, VAs, everything, because I didn't focus. Um, Munif was just on my podcast this week, and I asked him that. I'm like, yo, what was the difference between, you know, before you got into sub two till you got into sub two? He's like, bro, just focus. I literally took months to just learn how to talk to sellers. Now, for me, I did the same thing. However, I was working legitimately like 20 hours a day, 10 of those figuring out how to talk to sellers, 10 of those working with my team. And I was just almost burning out, bro. And at the time, neglecting other parts of the business and wasting money. And that's where I want to ask you guys for guidance. Cause it's like, I want to, I really, really just want to focus on calling sellers at the same time. You know, there's a lot of ambitions, right? Like raising private money. Um, I got my own fix and flip company. So I, I want to lead that, right. I'm going to lead that. Um, when it comes to the acquisition side of things and, you know, arbitrage, like that's interesting to me, you know, um, paying for a long-term rental and, and turn it into a short-term rental. Right. So it's a lot of things, but I don't want to do it too fast where what you said, Mike, is where the burnout comes. I don't want that to happen. So Dude, you know, I know a person who spent like, I think it was 12 grand on a mailing campaign. Wow. Didn't get one lead from it and quit. To this day, has never done a deal, never did another campaign. It was like a few years ago. That's crazy. I'm like, bro, that's that easily could have happened to me. Good yeah. thing. On, honestly, the reason why I didn't is because I went to the mastermind and I had to rewire my brain. But um, yo, Pace, Pace says it all the time, bro. The the hardest part of real estate is not finding a deal. It's not you know closing a deal. It's there's too many avenues, right? It's way too many ways to be successful, right? So I would say, well, I would ask you, what do you want? That's my next question. What do you, yeah, what do you want? I want to make $250,000 my first year of real estate. Okay. So how are you going to do that? What's the fastest way to, to do that? I want to, I want to lock up contracts. I'm going to lock, I'm going to lock up 10 contracts this April. That's my goal. Double digit April. And I want to get my fix and flip team to get a uh, flip before June, our first flip as a team. Hey, Daryl, quick question. Yo. If you guys, if Nick locks something up under you guys' system and he wants to do these fix and flips, would you allow? Yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> Yo. We already started talking about it. Yeah. I already, know, I already, yeah, I already knew what you were going to ask, bro. Is, there is a deal that came across our pipeline that was in his market. And get, I don't like doing this, Bo, right? Remember I said that? Mm -hmm. What did I bring it to? I said, yo, Nick, underwrite this deal. Do you want to flip it? And he underwrote it. And he's like, yeah, we need it at this price. Mm -hmm. okay, so let's get it at that price so we can sell it to him. Bro, you are <laughs> a freaking boss. That's some boss shit. No, nah, but that's the thing, bro. Like he, the, for him to even think that and believe in me and like, yo, like this is your market, like, What's up? You know what I'm saying? It's putting the ball in my court. And that's what I respect is where it's like, yo, like this is eternal. Like there's so much money to be made. Like it'd be stupid not to squad up with people, y'all. Like squad up. Legit, bro. And Daryl, that's so dope that that went through your mind. Because when you're looking at your team and you're looking at their goals, you true like I truly, truly want my even just vert down to my virtual assistants, I want them to be freaking popping over there in the Philippines. Yep. Like I want them to be living the best life. I want everybody in their hood to 
look at them like, yo, what the heck are you doing? Yeah. Right. Um, so the Dow, the fact that that's your outlook on it and you really want Nick to eat and you're not looking at it. Nah, dude, just give me contracts. Don't be worrying about other shit. Bro, Nick, what did I what did I text you the other day? A while back. Daryl Daryl literally texted me. He's like, yo, my goal is to make you a hundred thousand a hundred thousand dollars this this year. And Bro, when I read that text, like the energy that like went through me, like, cause I didn't think like that, right? My goal was, my initial goal was to have 12 contracts my first year, right? One for each month. But that's mm -hmm. not 10X. That's not the thinking that is gonna, that's, that's a small pot, right? To plant your seed in. I need to plant it in an acre. So at, right after that, once I got my first contract locked up or like that three in March, basically is when I was like, Yo, I'm doing 30 contracts my first like my first year. I want at least 30 contracts, 100%. So Daryl was opening my mind there is, yo, like it's fruitful, like 100K. And guess what, bro? I talked to Claudio and Claudio's like, you should be, you, you're going to make $250,000 your first year. And then even more, I'm like, okay, that's what I'm going to do. But you got to really want that, right? I can't just say because Claudio says it now. It's... Oh, Claudio said it. It's it's that's now just because he said it, right? I really do believe I'm gonna make a quarter mil the first year of real estate. That's a fact. I love that, I love that bro. You got bro. You have all the abilities to do it. You have the drive to do it. You have the the commitment, and you got it. I would say now, focus, right? Focus on closing deals and doing flips. Mm -hmm. Right, doing wholesales and flips, right? Like Airbnb is gonna be there. And I know it's a sexy thing right now, but if your Excellent. goal right now is strictly that that cash, that active cash coming in, you want two hundred fifty thousand. I would say go for that. Like so, yeah. your activities should be strictly things that are gonna that are gonna do that, right? The 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 Airbnb that's passive money. Right. That's going to take a lot of your time up, you know, setting shit up. People don't people don't talk about the the parts of the Airbnb where you're setting it up and you're, you're paying your private money as you're setting it up, not making any money for the first two months because you need to do repairs. You need to update it. You need to to get it furnished. You need to put it on the site. Like people don't talk about that. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's going to take up a whole lot of your time where it's going to keep you off the phones and closing deals. Mm -hmm. right? So build that foundation. I know you have your team to where. You don't even need to. Well, we'll talk about your your flip team. Uh, quick, are you like when you guys get a flip? Are you gonna be doing like the actual, like, flip, like the contracting part, or like 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 what does that look like? Yeah, so we got people. We have ten people on the team, right? Beast Coast Flips. Shout out to Beast Coast Flips in the Northeast Market. And what we do is we ha we have a pipeline of whether that comes to acquisitions, finance team, um, the dispo, the contracting, the project management, everyone's on a team, right? And actually right after this, we're going to go over, you know, the profit first model, the money model and the time management model. Because just like you, Daryl, like I really, really don't like micromanaging and I want to make sure everyone's tasks are very specific where everything gets done. Right. Because right now it's like all about systemizing and integrating and stuff like that. And I'm not the best with it. Right. And it's also a point where like the, like I'm not going to get Bitrix right now. I'm not going to get like batch leads for the whole team right now. And I want to use the funds from our first flip to start getting all that and, and doing that stuff. So it's in a process is where everyone's in a different spot. Right. How this was formed was it's actually an accountability group in Flip Me. And we were the smallest one. And my man, Eric, had a vision. And I see that vision clearly every single day I wake up where we are fixing and flipping properties as a team. And when new people join Flip Me, we're going to JV with them, right? Because Flip Me, how it's set up is, hey, listen, you join, you do these modules, you get your first flip. Boom. You get your first flip in a month. It's not like that. I'll tell you, like, it's not like that. Fix and flip. And Mike knows, like, and that's why I want to talk to Mike is like, there's so many things that you won't see in a fix and flip that could come up. You know what I'm saying? So you really got to make sure that your, your costs and everything like are, are to a T. You need to make sure every, every team is, is focusing on, on their goal and making sure they can achieve that. So what does a 10 person team look like? 
I'm, I'm, I'm in the process of figuring out myself. Right. So, and we're having this meeting today. So it's like, we have, we have four people on acquisitions and everyone should be getting a deal, right? Everyone should be looking for a deal. Um, whether that's through social media, um, we're going to pull a list in Pennsylvania and Pittsburgh and, you know, I'm going to get on a, on a schedule where everyone's calling. And my, my job is to, you know, train, train them to be the best, sell, uh, you know, salespeople they could be. Right. So you're, you're trying to, you're trying to scale a direct to seller business. Exactly. Not a fix and flip business. Well, uh, for acquisitions, you know what I'm saying? Like it's, it's fix and flip. Right. But there's an acquisition team to get our deals. Right. And then we can pay ourselves through that. We can also source deals through other wholesalers. Right. And that's something that we do have people doing. So look at it from a standpoint as those are two separate businesses, like your direct to seller model where you're reaching out to sellers directly with your VAs and your phone lists and all these things. That's a whole separate business from your fix and flip business. Okay? Got you. Like they're way two different things. And as a matter of fact, um, that one that I was just talking about, we were going to wholesale it to ourselves mm -hmm. because we got salespeople, we got virtual assistants, we got systems and all these things on our direct to seller business that we got to pay for. So it wouldn't be responsible for us to just go not get any money on the initial part of the deal that we could reinvest back into our team because we got to pay our salesperson a percentage on it, right? So thinking about them from two different perspectives um, is going to allow you to scale both models easier. It's going to keep it a little bit more organized. It's going to be, um, it's just going to run a little bit more efficiently. So what I was just thinking in my head, right? Let's just say this deal comes up with Daryl. With that being said, doing a fix and flip, it you got to meet contractors. You got to get all your funding together. It's a lot of things that go into a fix and flip that you got to account for. That you got to account for. So I was thinking, like, let's just say you get a contract from Daryl's team. Maybe instead of going to now take your time on a fix and flip, right? So going to meet contractors, doing all these things maybe bring it to another fix and flipper in your market and say, Hey bro, I have this deal. Can we utilize your team and let's go halves on it or something like that. You know what I mean? hundred um, percent. That way, let him manage it. You're going to kind of eat the profit a little bit, but let him manage it. And you're going to see the whole entire process of a fix and flip, at least for the first couple. And now you're able to go back, in Daryl's team and just keep cranking all these contracts, keep getting good at talking to sellers, you know? Mm -hmm. because yeah, I love that squad up on the flip. Exactly. Essentially, yeah, with somebody who's um, very well versed in the fix and flip world. Because the thing about it, these fix and flippers, they have no idea how to go talk to sellers. They don't know how to manage VAs. They don't know nothing. They just know how to go look at a deal. Hey, is this a deal? Okay, cool. Yeah, my guy's going to get on it. Feed, go feed the beast. Brandon, we want to we'll be that beast too at some point. But why don't we just squat up so I can understand how to go be that beast and I can run two different beasts at the same time. Yeah. And so that's my question to you then, Mike, is like, do I, for acquisitions going direct to seller, do I totally switch it and just find deals through, do I just pick one method? Like, is it going to be, okay, Lanza method. Let's, let's get leads like that. Let's start calling dead lists. Or do I just go on social media and find good deals from good wholesalers? It depends, man. It depends on what you're, um, what you're looking to accomplish. Like the reason why I have a direct to seller model and the reason why I like it is because I'm in control. Now, however, there's much more managing. I'm putting in much more hours. I'm spending much more money. But that's just what my appetite was. So it kind of depends on what your appetite is, where you're at in your career at the moment. All these things kind of depend on what route you're going to go. The route that you're going right now with Daryl is freaking amazing for your the, the, point, the point in time that you're at right now. 100%. Because, you know, you just left your job not too long ago. It's not going to be a crazy burden for you to go spend five grand a month on a whole system. You know what I mean? Let me just go plug in and really learn how a system works. And now that I'm thinking about it, with that being said, you're plugging into Daryl's system. 
you're learning Daryl's system. 100%. That was always a thing for me too, is like, you know, me and Daryl had the conversation and I'm like, I already know, like I'm, I'm ready to be here as long as Daryl, Daryl's cool with it. Right. I'm a part of his team. And we've had the conversation, like, it's like, I'm directly modeling everything. I'm learning everything that Daryl's doing with his business. And when he adds new things and how he maneuvers, like I'm learning that and taking that in for my own business as well. I was actually thinking about that earlier. Like you guys are, are, I'm learning still too. Like I'm still growing myself. So like you guys are being patient enough to, to see that. Yeah, I'm still, I'm still learning. I'm still trying to figure this stuff out at the same time. And at mm -hmm. the same time, like I'm still, I still have a pretty established business, right? Like you guys can learn a whole lot from what I got going on. And I learned from you guys as well. Like I learned, like, why do you think when we do role plays, I ask for everybody's feedback, everybody, right? Cause I'm still learning, right? I learned from y'all. So like, I mean, to, to get it off topic a little bit, but like, that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, and what I would say, you have 10 people on your team, right? I would utilize um, realtors as well. People don't, people won't forget about realtors and on market deals. Um, Darren Talca just said it in the in the Facebook comments. Um, Jamil has a whole training on how to how to utilize realtors and not only just wholesaling, but you can use flips with on market deals as well. That's where a lot of these people are are finding are finding their deals, right? A lot of these flippers find deals from realtors. So I would say have your acquisitions people rather than having them cold call, have them connect with wholesalers, have them connect with realtors, have them connect with everybody bro get in these facebook groups yeah. um, and find deals because people have deals yeah that's true i, I appreciate it because we we're actually going to go go through with this on on starting monday and i think that is the best pivot is to utilize these realtors make these relationships with realtors because that's already something you want to do right and and it'd be better to do that instead of cold calling realtors and get in these groups and and find these deals and then we get together and i educate them on okay this is why this is not a deal this is why this is a deal and so on and so forth so you just full-fledged already got your 10 team going 10 team member team going like you already yeah. got everybody yeah we kind of just took like imperfect action and, and got it going um one thing that i do and i think like people that everyone has a different desire right and it is my job. Like I want, I want the whole team to take a disc assessment, the personality assessment to see how we can better engage and, and utilize their strengths and, you know, a weakness. If there's a 10 person team and you have a weakness, you don't, someone else ha is, is strong in that department. So, you know, that's, that's kind of what I want to um, go with there, but it's really a matter of like people executing right now. Right. And I don't know if that needs to come down with someone putting the, putting their foot down and really like, being realistic about things um but why what made you go do that like you did you just go with daryl not too long ago i forget what, what was that timeline like when did you get on daryl's team that was february and you know flip me is isn't sub two right so my man eric we were calling well oh, you're in flip me yeah okay i don't really know what that um, One does, bro. You're good because because they actually closed it down due to A and E, and they aren't working on it as much. But it's a great time for us to get like real intimate with each other because there's only 170 people in it, mm -hmm. and a lot of those people are big dogs. Like they're actively doing flips. Shout out to Marvin. Mm -hmm. Shout out to Barbara. Shout out to Carlo and Vincent Lanza's in there. So there's big dogs in there, but it's it's kind of like that's what it started out as, right? Accountability turned into turned into um, a partnership, right? And from there, it really is about creating the organization and the structure. And, you know, my job is to remind everyone the vision every single day. And I really got to do a better job at identifying the willpower in people. And from there, you know, we're going to have to make a decision, right? Um, Mike, I want to I hear your thoughts on because I, I already told Nick what I thought about about the ten like ten people team. Yeah. I feel like that's a lot, especially if you guys are all partners and not like you don't have like employees, right? Yeah, wait, wait, hold on. So you were working with Daryl, and then through Flip Me, ten people in that mentorship said, "Hey, 
Let's all split a business 10 ways. Yes. Holy crap. <laughs> and what does the business look like? What it looks like is everyone has their own thing, right? And that's where, that's where like you have to bring it all together is because people have W2s in this business. People just joined Flip Me and some of them don't know about real estate. So what it is, is it's like trying to figure all that out. Meanwhile, someone owns a Kegley in Kentucky, shout out to Natasha and two other girls are doing their short-term rentals. So it's a matter of getting a time commitment and figuring out, listen, how do we generate some, some flips? How do we get these flips going? Right. And I have shout out my man, Eric, he's, he's been doing construction for 30 years. So I'm confident that when we do get a deal that, you know, that process, when it comes to contractors and, you know, all the right finishes and all the right materials is, is going to get done. Um, but like you guys said, it's a lot of people and it's a lot of different personalities and yeah, that's kind of the, that's kind of the issue, right? Is like, I don't want to babysit being a leader with 10 people. It's hard to even get everyone to, to commit or to see the slack and, and things like that. That's what I'm going through. And it's, it's frustrating and it could help, it could push me down, but I'm going to, I'm going to not assume things and just continue to, to reach out is what I have to do. Okay. Bro, uh, give part, it to me straight up. Cause all these thoughts that you're going to say are already in my head. Partnerships are freaking hard, bro. And they have to align like perfectly. And I've been in multiple of them and they have to, really really truly aligned like le actually i was just having this conversation bro with somebody in sub two mm -hmm. he's like dude i'm getting started um I, I like i don't even want to deal with the systems i just want to go find a partner so he can do the systems i'm like bro but like what do you have to value to a really true good integrator he's like well i mean i've done some things before and um, and in other businesses and things like that. I'm like, okay, do you know how to talk to sellers? He's like, no, not really. I'm like, okay, think about this, bro. Um, Nick, I'm assuming you're sort of a visionary type of person. Yeah. For those who, who are listening, a visionary type of person is somebody who is, you know, out in the field talking to sellers. They're the relationships guy in the business. They're like the quote unquote face of the business. They're the, the closer. They close the big deals. Right. The integrator is the guy in the background. He's like the puppeteer, like figuring out all the systems and figuring out how everything maneuvers. Every and business has them in any yeah. industry. And I don't want to do that. <laughs> right. So here's the deal, bro. I was telling this dude, I'm like, you need to attract an integrator. You need to attract a good integrator. In order to do that, you have to value has to be pouring out of you. Like sh people should look at you like, yo, I would be freaking. I would be blessed to have this dude on my team. Yep. You know, mm -hmm. so when an integrator comes in your world, they're like, yo, I have this. You got to think how an integrator thinks. They mm -hmm. think, OK, they think very analytical. All right, I know I'm going to put this X amount of dollars in. Like, I know my systems are going to work. The CRM is going to work this way. We're going to generate this amount of leads. We're going to do this. this, this. I don't want to give this to somebody. I don't want to build this whole entire system out and then have some stupid visionary fuck it all up. That's going in the back of their mind. So when they're thinking about a partnership, they're like, yo, I have this beautiful freaking system in mind that I need to go give to a killer. You go find that person who's that integrator that's really sitting there thinking about that by value just pouring out of you yep. as a visionary. Like, legit, it, it happened with Pace and Cody. Cody heard, I think it was Pace with um, Steve Trang on a podcast. And he, Cody must have just heard value pouring out of Pace. Like, yo, this dude can talk to sellers. It's freaking amazing. Like, I have this crazy system. I need to go feed the beast. I can't go, I can't go bring my system to somebody else. It just wouldn't make sense because I know they're not going to take care of my baby like that. But with 10 people, bro, the value exchange is hard. 
That's where yeah. it works in is in the value exchange. You know? Yeah. So and that's some people, there's a lot of moving parts in that. Especially when there's no systems in place, right? To to check. Like Daryl can see if someone's making 30 calls a day, right? And if on an honor system with people that just put money up, you know what I'm saying? It's it's hard to judge, right? Because anyone could put money up and you you did at one time have that belief. And your that dream is there, right? You put a good amount of money up to join Flip Me, but after that is what defines it, right? So all everything you're saying is Let in me my say one more thing. Please, um, I went to the mastermind and I freaking love these guys. They're probably listening to them to this right now. We had this amazing idea, super super similar to your idea, where we're like, yo, we're gonna squat up and we're gonna make a big ass team full of VAs with like freaking 15 VAs and we're going to crush it and make a bunch of deals because everybody's juices are flowing. Everybody's like, yo, I can't wait to crush it. Right? Like we're all super excited. Mm -hmm. We got back from the mastermind and we started doing things and people started trickling off a little bit, trickling off there, trickling off there. Eventually we were just like, yo, we're super good homies. Like I love you. But at the end of the day, we just got to go figure out our own things. And it was the best decision ever because I think if we went forward with trying to partner up on something very similar that you're talking about, it probably wouldn't have went well because we're all like all three of us are visionaries. It just, it yeah. really wouldn't have made sense. Yeah. And that's a similar, similar situation that I had too. Um, right. I'd left my partnership. We were all visionaries. Right. And we're all stepping on each other's toes and things just weren't getting done. Right. We're bumping heads a lot. And we're all really good friends, right? So I'd rather choose the I chose that relationship, kept the relationship, and walked away from the business, right? And then just started providing so much value to Sub Two that my integrator found me, right? I made a post. I actually I made a post in Sub Two saying I was looking for an integrator, and I had about fifty people reach out, and that's because what Mike was saying, I provided value. Value was just flowing, bro, like it's crazy. Right. So it's it's tough, bro. And I, I, I would say like starting off with partnerships, you always want to start off JV. Right. You guys want to do a couple of deals together first and see if it's even a good fit. See if people are going to pull their weight and have that yeah. upfront contract. Right. Upfront contracts are so much bigger than just talking to sellers. Yeah. Like what was my upfront contract with you? You remember? Yeah. You're going to be here for six months to a year. And this is what the percentages look like and stuff like that. Yo, chill out. My sales guy's gonna listen to this and be like, yo. <laughs> <laughs> right? So I told him the same thing. He's gonna be like, yo, all you motherfuckers saying the same shit. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, that's that's you upfront contracts are big, right? So, especially with partnerships, you want to make sure everything's laid out. You guys know exactly what who's supposed to be doing what. So you guys aren't stepping on each other's toes and try it out for a few deals and if it doesn't work then figure it out 10 partners is really hard bro i would say if you have like two partners is good <laughs> like two or three partners is, is good like yeah, three, three is hard. better three is hard three is really hard two is good right and then the rest if they're in positions to where they're employees i don't want to really say employees but like they're they're all working together trying to fix squad up right that would make things a lot easier because now these people aren't don't feel entitled, right? They put money into it. Now they feel entitled to get a piece of every single deal, even if they didn't do shit. Yeah, and that you got to touch it. And that, that's the thing, too. Like, it's my first time saying it. And I know a lot of people in the group already feel like that and it's it feel have these similar feelings. And it, pro it wasn't brought up because these upfront contracts weren't created. And now it's in the process of trying to squeeze the upfront contract in. And is it really getting to you? Um, and communi communicating is everything. That's something that I learned. I learned the hard way. I didn't. I wasn't the best communicator in my last partnership. I wasn't, mm -hmm. and I, I knew that about myself. I realized that after things ended, right? Mm -hmm. I wasn't. If I, I think if I would have communicated better, it would have been a little bit easier, right? But communicating is everything, bro. And, yeah. and learn from my mistakes, right? Like you see me. I, I was just telling you, right? Like, I, I'm like, yo, I, I feel like I, I'm scaling a little too fast. Like, I need to slow down a little bit. Um, and I, I was just telling you this. 
right? Yeah. So like learn learn from my mistakes, bro. Like that's yeah. that's one of the, the biggest things I could tell you. Like while you're you're on my team, learn from my mistakes. Learn from what I'm doing wrong and what I'm doing right and what I'm doing wrong. Don't do that. Right. Just figure out the right way to do it or watch how I figure out the right way to do it. Cause like I told you, I'm still growing, I'm still learning. Right. So take notes, watch everything. Mm. Like you see how the, how my visionary integrated partnership works. How often do you see Sadiq? He's a, I don't see him, but when I need him, he's there. <laughs> and that dude does a lot. Yeah, exactly. He does a lot. Yeah. Right. Like I can't even explain how much he does. He does a yeah. lot, but he's behind the scenes. Right. And he, he pretty much puts things together. He puts things in place. Right. So and I knew, man, I knew in the beginning, like, it's it's going too fast. And I always had these ideas where it's like 10 people is a lot, right? You got to judge everyone's commitment and everything like that. And, I mean, I, it looks like, you know, you have to make a tough decision and some uncomfortable conversations are going to have to come through to really pinpoint um, the direction of the business. Nick, I bet your um, integrated partner is in that 10-person group. For sure. I already know who, who it is. A hundred percent. They just a hundred percent. I know it's just the commitment thing. You know what I'm saying? Like I know an integrator a hundred percent is in there as well. So this is interesting. Mike speak on this. Do you think all integrators attend the mastermind? Um, I'm assuming what he's saying is, do you think integrators don't attend the mastermind because they're not like the, most outgoing people is that is that the question i wish we could just bring people up here from the comments that would be dope <laughs> um well with that being said i if that's the question there's all walks of earth at pace's mastermind there's people who have never done a deal there's people that have done a hundred deals there's people that have um, built like million dollar businesses that have nothing to do with real estate. There's integrators, there's visionaries, there's all walks of earth um, at the mastermind. So these rooms are rooms where you find partners. Like getting in the right rooms is where you find partners for sure. Yeah. Going to that New York City meetup was just such, it was like one of the best days of my life. Uh, meeting with everyone and just... With, with that being said, you got to be careful, though, because in those rooms, there's a lot of emotion and there's a lot of like hype. Everybody's hyped up. The, the best part of a business is in the beginning. Literally, the best part ever in the business is Word. in the beginning is when you're thinking about it and you're like, yo, this is going to be so dope. So when you're in a room and everybody's feeling that same feeling it's super easy to just get connected to somebody. Yeah. So I think in these rooms, you do find good partnerships, but you just got to be, be super careful. A hundred percent. And you can also spot out people who are like, just there to take a picture with pace or like, you know what I'm saying? You could spot out people that are, are genuine and not um, pretty quickly. I, I feel like, cause there's a lot of hype going on. Right. And if, if you give into that hype and you give into this, Oh, Pace and Jamil are famous, like all that stuff like that. You can kind of pinpoint stuff like that and see mm -hmm. who's there. To, to I network. think naturally the partnerships come when you're just pouring value out to the earth. It's going like, to come to you. My partnership came from me because I was just pouring out value. Somebody recognized it. And then that somebody came in contact with the integrator and she referred my partner to me. She was like, yo, you guys need to go connect. And then we went out for coffee and I knew that he was going to be a great partner. Did you guys do deals together first or did you guys just jump into a partnership? <laughs> I'm crazy, bro. I just kind of just jumped into it. You jumped into it? <laughs> because I just saw the value and I was, I'll be honest. And I, this screwed me in the past. I just got lucky. It screwed me in the past where I'm just like, yo, you're, you're almost in like um, desperate need of help because you're wearing too many hats. And then somebody mm -hmm. pops up in your, your world and you're like, yes, please, let's do this together. Right. So that has screwed me in the past. And it's one of my honest, honestly, dude, it's one of my bottlenecks in my life. Like I'm too 
too quick with things. I'm I'm very quick. Impulsive. I mean that I'm I'm the same way, bro. I'm the same way. I'm I'm very impulsive, and that's something that I'm learning to 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 handle, right? Like stopping and thinking. But at the same time, I don't really don't think that's a that's a bad thing. At the same time, the right? If you you hesitate too, right? If you hesitate too much, yeah, you may may miss out, right? It's so. good when you have the right people in your life because. I do it all the time. I'm like very impulsive. Like I just want to move fast. And my yeah. partner's like, yo, hold on, bro. <laughs> like maybe we should think about this. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. You're right. Leo, um, yes, you should attend the mastermind if you have a chance. I think Super everybody cool. should attend masterminds, bro. Like just get into yeah, those rooms, bro. Like just get into I can't those rooms. Yeah, mm -hmm. get into those rooms, but don't analysis paralysis at the same time. But get like get into as many rooms as you can with with people that are doing it. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, yeah like, everybody. We're, we're all in one of us in the business. You should. Oh, do you it. Said what? Leo asked, "Do all? Do you think all integrators should attend the mastermind?" I think any anybody should do it. Like, no matter what where you're at in the business. Yeah. And like speaking of getting into those rooms, like like we're all we all work on our mindset every single morning in the same exact room. Like we all go to the morning mindset coffee with Marlon. Shout out to Marlon if you guys want to want to get into that. Hit me up. I'll, I'll send you a link. Um, hit me up. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's that's that. So what what's what's the importance of like getting into those rooms and and talking to other people who are and connecting with other people who are are like minded and aligned on the, the same type of journey you are. Here yeah, this, this show is caused by those rooms. Yeah, that's it. Like legitimately, I connected with Daryl. I think we connected. To be honest, I forget when we connected, but it was in that room in the morning, in that morning mindset coffee room, right? Where I looked at Daryl. I'm like, "Yo, I need to squat up with somebody on a on a show like this." And I saw that Daryl didn't really have a podcast. I was like, yo, he needs a podcast. He 100%. 100%. He drops a post and everyone's everyone's there chatting with him. So it, mm -hmm. it'd be, you know, it's about time. So that's how this was created. But um, yeah, Bro, dude. I, I really appreciate you for that, Mike. Like that, that really, it's, it's kind of, you kind of, for, I, I told you, like you're, you're kind of forcing me to, to elevate and it's big, bro. It's big. So Super big. And, Likewise, bro. And that's exactly what morning mindset does, right? Is it continues you on that vibration and it forces you to elevate. Like if someone, if you're around a bunch of millionaires, Marlon says it all the time. If you're around a bunch of millionaires, they're going to pull you up. They're going to pull your ship at that Harbor and make you a millionaire, right? You just have to strive for it and, and continue to be consistent. Word. And just like protecting that energy, bro. Like, like that saying that everybody talks about fear, if you if your friends are all million, if you have four millionaire friends, like you're gonna be the fifth, right? Mm. That's not bullshit. <laughs> like it's mm. it's really not because they're gonna force you to want to elevate. They're gonna put you in place places to to elevate and do things to them, do things for them and with them, right? So like that's why it's so good to to know who you want to connect with. See these people like okay, just like Mike, like Mike, Mike knew he wanted to connect with me, right? Like I'm not, I'm not. Me and Mike are kind of like the same at the same level. Like we're still figuring this shit out. But like he knew he wanted to connect with me. He reached out and he's like, yo, let me provide some value. Right. And that's what we need to do with people who are doing better than us, who are people who are at that level that we want to be at. Right. And we just need to figure out who they are, how they can help us get there and how we can provide value to them. You know, so that's that's big. Like I was thinking about that last night, like. The people like I was watching. Um, I was on Marlon had a Marlon had a live with with Carlos 10x, and they were talking about that, right? Like, how do they find these people who are on their list to you know to talk to and, and connect with? And he was telling his story about how he got on Grant Cardone's radar, and he had a plan. Like, he went to to the to that mastermind with a plan. He knew that he was going to connect with Grant Cardone. He knew that he was going to leave there, and Grant Cardone was going to know his name, right? So like like me, I'm, I just started thinking about okay, I'm going to Clever in a couple in a couple of weeks. There's some big name people there. No, I don't have the the highest ticket. I'm not going to be in the dinners with the with those people, which I, I'm a little I'm a little upset I didn't get to do that. But 
I have people on my radar that we're going to connect with. Like, I know exactly how it's going to happen. If we may not, I may not tell them the vision I have for our, our relationship on, um, on that day. Right. It may not happen that day, but it's going to happen. Right. It, it's going to happen sooner or later. Yeah, bro. Same. So talk about some of the goals that you have for that meetup. For the meetup, bro? You have to get like too, too in depth, but. Well, it, it's just connect with, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say who it, who, who it is, but it's just connecting with those people that, that are on my radar, right? Introducing myself, making sure we have these, the in-person conversations, right? And I know in the back of my mind that we're going to, what, what we're going to do five, 10 years down the line. Like I know exactly what's going to happen, right? But my plan is to get there, provide value to them and just get on their radar, right? Get on their radar and make them know who, who Daryl is, right? And that's, that's like my whole thing. I want, they were just talking about that. They were saying how attention is money, right? The more attention you get, the more money, it, it, co- it directly correlates to each other, bro. The more attention you get, the more money you're going to get, right? So I want everybody to know who Daryl Ellison is, bro. Everybody, right? It's And I have these people that I know exactly who are going to help me get to that, to that point, and I'm going to provide value to them, bro. I'm going to meet up with them. I'm going to introduce myself, and I'm going to provide value. Where did that come from? Getting in the right rooms, <laughs> getting in the right rooms, bro, and listening to how people who are successful are doing this, how they're getting on radar. And that it literally clicked to me last night, bro. I didn't it didn't come from anywhere else but that live last night. I was on live last night at freaking 11, 930 at night on a Friday night. Right. Where most people are out partying and drinking right doing all that stuff that doesn't interest me right now i'm i'm in there getting value from a millionaire a multi-millionaire right seeing how he operates so i'm like okay i'm about to go to a mastermind in a couple weeks let me put let me write some people down who are on my radar and let me get on their radar let me make sure they know who i am right because if that's how a, a millionaire just got on to a billionaire's radar right why would not do the same thing Mm-hmm. You know, I love that being being intentional, and it actually saves your energy, right? That you don't have to use when you get there, and then think, okay, I want to meet this person, this person, this person. You already know prior, so it it does free up headspace in that in that regard as well. Yeah, I do it with everything. Like I have to call a seller right after this, and I already know exactly what I'm going to say to him. And I was oh, thinking yeah. about it in the shower this morning. Mm-hmm. Like, hmm, how am I gonna go about this? I need to get this contract. Oh, got it. Yep. <laughs> yep. Hundred percent. Intentional, bro. Being intentional, knowing what you want, and and sometimes you just gotta plant seeds, right? Like I was saying, like I'm not gonna just go out there and say, introduce myself and say, hey, this is the business idea we have, right? Let's do this now, right? I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna just plant some seeds and and. Get on the radar, bro. Yeah, bro, Daryl, you're gonna go big, bro. Yo, Be Nick, big, bro. So, what are your thoughts, bro? What do you say? What are your thoughts? Like, what's your game plan? My game plan after this is having uncomfortable conversations um, to figure out whether everyone's intention on a partnership is something that we're looking to do, or. And definitely as well, uh, when it comes to direct to seller and all that stuff is my whole thought is switched there. The first thing is how do I salvage, right? I'm not going to immediately just go, okay, I'm getting out, right? That's not, that's not my intention there. I want to, cause like you said, Mike, there is an integrator in there and I already know who that integrator is. Um, from there, it's just about structure. That test will come into play. I'd rather have it be um a test prior to creating the partnership but it's already created right impulsive action is already created so we're going to to systemize everything run run the play run the run the test and from there we'll be able to come back and have another another conversation and say okay this is where it's this is what we need to work on or 
hey, I don't think this is the best thing for me. Why do you want to do direct to seller? I think that's what I'm comfortable with. That's why. That was just my first initial thing. That's the only thing I started with, right? So I started cold calling. I only ever went direct to seller. Like I tried agents for a little bit, but I didn't try for more than a week straight. You know, the only thing I tried and put my all into was the cold calling so far, the direct to seller. Well, it makes sense. So when you're going direct to seller, like for my business, these sellers go through a funnel and there's a specific type of conversation on all three levels. There's the cold caller conversation. There's a lead manager conversation. And then there's the acquisition manager conversation. And there's a specific script and structure that all levels abide by. So the fact that right now you are plugging into Daryl's business and talking to sellers, you're essentially building out that acquisition manager level, right? That type of conversation, which is dope because from there, because every here's the thing for me, this kind of just is how my business operates. It started with how my acquisition manager conversations go. And then I built out what the lead manager script looks like and what the cold caller script looks like, because I don't want them to be having the same type of conversations as me. I don't want them asking the same questions as me. You know what I mean? So from there, I kind of reverse engineered the whole entire structure. So now the lead manager has a different type of conversation than I do. And she teased me up. So from top to bottom, everybody tees the person up. And you started, you said you reversed it. You started with yourself and then you went to lead and cold calling. I just recently did that and it's freaking crushing it because I, I kind of switched up our scripts and our structure a little bit. And here's what I ended up doing. I took my sales process, taught it to my acquisition manager. So he understands my sales process when he's listening to my calls and things like that. And then I got on a call with my lead manager who she's a beast. And I built out that conversation and what that should look like with her. So, Hey, what do you feel comfortable with? Where's your um, problems in your conversations right now? And we built that out together because previously what I did is I tried to just think of everything in my mind to put it on paper and then teach it to them. And it really hit when I had them help me build it up. Bro, that's so good. I swear I just wrote that down, bro. That's so good. It, it's been such a game changer, bro, just within the past like month. Because before, dude, I was just like, hey, let me just throw them on a generic script here. Same thing with the lead manager and then same thing with me. And by the time it got to me as acquisition manager, before I brought in a person to do it, it was like, the sellers were annoyed. You know what I mean? So now they're they're being handheld through the whole entire process. I love that. And they know exactly what's happening from here to here to here. So let me ask you, what do those different like what's the what's what do those different conversations look like between the cold caller and the lead manager? How are they like disqualifying every single thing? And is the cold caller really just getting the four pillars? What does it look like? The cold call is pretty much just getting the four pillars. So I've built out, they're, they're the most scripted out of all the levels. And they're just having a simple conversation should only take like three minutes. Gotcha. And they're just finding somebody who's interested in selling and has motivation. They don't care about condition. Um, they try to get the price as well, but sometimes it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. And then my lead manager looks at those leads from three levels. Is it hot? Is it warm? Is it perspective? And for all three of those, she has a different type of conversation. For the hot ones, she doesn't dig into it anymore. She just sets the appointment for the acquisitions team. For the medium ones, for the warm ones, she sort of does the same thing. However, she asks the seller for a recap of what they went over. Hey, could you just give me a recap of what you and da 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 went over? And then from there, she asked some polling questions, right, to qualify it as an acquisition lead. And then if it's perspective, if they said no, like there's definitely some motivation there, but they said no, they're not looking to sell for another six to 12 months. Um, 
she lets that be known. Hey, I know that you didn't, I know you said that you weren't looking to sell your property for six to 12 months. Could you just give me a little recap for my notes? She also introduces herself as the relationship manager who will be in contact from here on out until they're ready to sell. You just dropped gems, bro. I'm going back to watch that. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's so good. Damn. Yo, so we're we're running short on time here. We actually over over 25 minutes. But well, um, Nick, dude, what what questions do you have, man? Can about your business, about mindset, anything? Like what? what you I got? got I got one question for y'all, and actually, like Natasha just asked me. Like I I was like, listen, like we need an integrator, and she's like, what do you mean about an integrator? Do you need someone to set and lead the meeting agenda? But the integrator, like, just what? They do a lot of stuff, right? Like, what is everything? Huh? Read Rocket Fuel. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's the answer. Read Rocket Fuel. Have your team read Rocket Fuel. Because what you're going to end up seeing, and I don't want to, like, I mean, what what you're going to end up seeing is, bro, like, that 10 is going to have to shrink, right? Unless people are are willing to, to, play their position and, you know, be a, you can't have 10, you're not going to have 10 leaders, right? You're going to have yeah. one or two leaders, right? The leaders are, are uh, their job. And this is what Marlon's been saying, right? A leader's job is to hold that vision, that team vision and make sure everybody's aligned and make sure everybody's following that vision. Right. So 10 people, right. That's you're, it's gonna be a lot. It's gonna be a lot of visions, right? It's gonna be a lot of visions with ten people, right? So unless people are willing to to jump into like a a smaller role and are willing to, like Kesson's been saying, submit to the the vision, you're gonna see that team shrink a bit, right? So I would have everybody read Rocket Fuel, right? You may find out that there's nine there's nine visionaries and one integrator. Right. Mm-hmm. You just yeah. don't know. Have everybody read Rock a few of everybody take the test. You take it yourself and have a conversation about it. Yeah, bro. It sounds like it looks like there's a train, right? And then there's 10 different routes to train that can go. And everybody wants to go in a certain route. And mm-hmm. it looks like everybody's trying to operate the train. Yeah. And then when, the, when it gets to the point where there's a fork where all them things break off, the train is like, <laughs> flip that bitch. <laughs> right. Rather than just, boom, there's one route. And now there's one person in the, you know, doing the directoring. And they're, the other nine are in the back freaking pumping the thing or something to make the train go. Yeah. Shoveling that coal. 100%. And I think that's what it's going to have to be, right? Is the submission to taking more of an employee uh, approach about it. Right? Because... There's so what is it? So there's visionaries, there's integrators, employees, and then is there anything else that I'm that I'm like missing? Nah, I mean for a partnership, bro, it's a visionary mm-hmm. and an integrator. Maybe. What do you say? Like vendors and um, people that you use, like attorneys and yeah, but that's not that's not part of like that. They're just pieces of the puzzle, right? Mm-hmm. Like when you're talking about partnership and who's gonna actually run the business and you know, come up with the vision of the business and hold that vision in front of everybody and be the, the actual leaders, right? You have a, your visionary and you have your integrated, right? Everybody else falls into place, you know? So mm-hmm. I would definitely have everybody read that, read that book, Rocket Fuel. Um, our viewers too, if you're not, if you haven't read Rocket Fuel and you have a business, and you have a business partner, both of you guys read it, take the test and figure out like, who each other, who, who you guys are, right? Who's the visionary? Who's the integrator? And they're going to have a tough conversation after that. Tough conversations, right? <laughs> tough conversations. Because now you know exactly what you got to do, right? Like if you're the visionary, there's no reason why you should be pulling lists and and fucking skip tracing and talking to VAs. Like I don't really talk to our VAs, right? Like I talk to Mary because she's my, my assistant, but like the, the code callers and stuff, I don't handle that. I don't do stuff like that, right? So you, that's how you're going to know what your lane is and you're going to be able to figure out 
what exactly you need to be doing on a daily basis. Appreciate that. Yeah, it's 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 focus, right? It's exactly what I did to when I'm, you know, when I join your team. It's the same concept of just focusing on what because I don't want I I I'm, I should be pulling lists. Mm-hmm. I should, no, nah. <laughs> um, think of any other questions. Yeah, no, nah, I mean this is good, man. It's good just to keep um, going on the path here, be consistent and. I appreciate you guys for having me on. Dude, thanks for coming on. Anytime, man. Hell yeah. Yeah, we just got to connect in like six months to see how that 10-man team went. (laughs) (laughs) Yo, we just got a comment in Facebook from one of of my mentors, right? And he says, non-disciplined entrepreneur are best at non-active dreamers, right? That's, yo, that's that's big, right? Like you want to be disciplined, right? And you can't be disciplined if you don't know what what the hell you're supposed to be doing on a daily basis. At that point, you're just dreaming, like you just want something, and dreamers are sleeping, <laughs> right? Like you're not doing nothing, you know. And so, I feel like I'm working with others that are non-disciplined. That's a problem. It is, bro. It's a big problem. Cool. I'm gonna have everyone watch this podcast from the team. <laughs> fuck Mike and Daryl. <laughs> Rocket people. Reading it today. I appreciate you guys. Yeah, bro. Sorry for your team. If they watch this and they're mad at us, I promise it's nothing personal. We we just want to point everybody in the right direction. You Tell know? them to come on the, the show. Yeah. 100%. We'll yeah, we'll get we'll get a bunch of people. The whole screen will be filled up. <laughs> <laughs> the next ten episodes should be every single person on that. Soap opera, bro. <laughs> That's funny. Well, no, yeah. that's the thing. I, I I do want it to work. I 100 percent want it to work, and it's just gonna get put through a test right now. Sounds good. Well, yeah. yo. I appreciate you so much, bro. You're awesome. You got big things in your future, bro. Like, keep doing what you're doing, dude. Keep being hungry. Keep being consistent. Keep grinding. Keep closing deals. You're going to go so far, bro. I'm proud of you, dude. I appreciate you. I have on some things together. 100%, Mike. 100%. Flipping shit like crazy. And that's, that's you know, Daryl said to me, he's like, yo, Mike is going to have a lot to tell you because – that's what we're looking to do, right? We're looking to get these flips going and, and generate cash like that. Yeah, so. Sweet. Man. I appreciate you guys, every all the viewers. Thanks for showing love and dropping comments and continue to keep watching it because it's every Saturday. Every Saturday, baby. All right, y'all. Host of Hard Knocks, episode two. Appreciate y'all for viewing. Appreciate you, Nick. Appreciate you, Mike. We out of here. Peace.